Welcome to Waterstones Piccadilly. Um, I'm here for about two seconds uh, before I hand over to someone who is much more proficient and professional at introducing than I am. But I would really like to welcome you all here. I know a lot of you have been at the London Book Fair all day. Um, so you're either intoxicated or exhausted or both. Um, but it's absolutely thrilling. Uh, to have this event on uh, Czech literature here this evening. Um, as you know, there, there are publishers, there are translators, everyone is here to discuss, you know, modern Czech classics, um, which is fantastic, and there's more of it better, I'd say. Um, but, but that's absolutely enough for me already. I'm going to hand over, and you will now have a proper introduction. So welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the official launch of the first English language translation of the Kde života náš je v půli se svou poutí, the midway upon the journey of our life. Uh, it's a darkly comic and long bent novel from one of the Czech literature's voices rediscovered after the fall of communism, Josef Jedlička. The novel was written between 1954 and 1957 and treats events from the Stalinist era of Czechoslovakia's post war communist regime. Now, due to its critical view of socialist society and the mythology that goes with it, Midway it remains unpublished until 1966, amid the easing of cultural control. But an uncensored version of this anti-heroic novel did not in fact appear in Czech until 1994. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the following members of the panel to discuss the Abitschka's novel. Uh, the translator of the novel himself, Alex Zuker, who is an award-winning uh, translator of Czech literature, also serves as the co-chair of Pen America Translation Committee, and he in fact has three translation uh, out in 2016, which is Jedlička's uh, Midway Open the Journey of Our Life, we will be discussing today, and then Tomasz Meshka's Love Letter from a Love Letter in Uniform, and Magdalena Platzlas the attempt. Then it's Rajandra Chiknis who wrote the afterword and was the editorial su uh, supervisor for the book. He is a senior lecturer in Czech, Slovak, and Russian literature at the University of Bristol, and his research focuses on Czech literature from, from the 19th century to present, and Russian and Slovak fiction, especially since the 1960s. He has published monographs on Russian, Czech, and Slovak fiction of the post-communist transition and on the Czech avant-garde novelist and dramatist Vladislav Vanchura. And finally, Owen Paperly, who is a British writer and journalist based in London who writes primarily on architecture, politics, and culture. He is the author of a number of publications, including the best-selling Landscape of Communism, which is a history of communism in Europe told through the built environments of former socialist states and was published by Alan Lane in June 2015. Now, Alex, I think you're going to begin with, uh, by giving us a quick flavor of, of the opening of the novel. Yeah. So can I? <coughs> Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> we can begin and end anywhere for we have not been a pact with victory, but with struggle. In the old days they began with childhood, yet how many mass graves have they filled in since then? What a terrible burden of vigilant loyalty has accrued to us over the years. What an effort we make to bear its weight, so we may still be capable of hope and love today, and perhaps again tomorrow. But I am writing a book. Somewhere in the middle of life comes a moment when a man must take his fate into his own hands. For it comes to pass that the young woman we hope for from birth and remember to our final hour marries and gives birth to a child. You kissed her just once, in the rain, on a street corner, with the perfume of heroic lilacs still in the air. The child, of course, is a boy, and he looks like you. He looks like you, your spitting image. And it comes to pass that they kill a poet before your eyes, and a weary policeman, a gentle soul, brings home a sheet of paper from an unfinished piece of writing folded into a fortune teller for his children. And then it comes to pass one day that tender young seamstresses, their doll-like busts working in graceful rhythm, put in overtime to mend the red banner of the revolution using the finest thread. And that is that moment. It usually comes before sunup, and from that point on, lyricism is done for. Okay, Alex, um, so what was it like to translate this text? <coughs> 
Yeah, that's an easy question. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, one thing I wanted to say about this uh, book was that uh, Petr Onufer is here, I hope, yes, was the one who brought the book to my attention. Uh, he thought I might be interested in translating it, and um, as you heard, it was written in the mid-1950s. And uh, at the time he told me about it, as far as I knew, there was no book from the 1950s that had been translated from Czech into English. Um, so that was appealing to me about it. Um, what I didn't realize uh, at first was that it's um, uh, heavily informed by uh, the theories and practice of this Russian formalist named Viktor Shklovsky. And uh, so I think in some ways this book was the hardest one I've, uh, I've ever had to translate because I felt like there were a lot of uh, times when I was working on the text where I understood the individual words, but I had no idea what he was talking about. I mean, I didn't study uh, literary theory. I actually didn't know anything about Viktor Shlovsky when I started the book. Um, so I had to know a lot about, um, I, had, I had to do some reading on, on what Shlovsky was, was on about. Um, the other thing is that, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, novels that have a lot of uh, very specific references to uh, what in Czech they call realia, you know, the kind of details, the everyday fabric of life. But um, this has got such specific references in it to, you know, types of posters that were hanging up around Prague in the, I should say, it's written in the mid-50s, but it's referring mainly to events that happened uh, from the end of World War II up until the time he began writing. So um, references to political posters that were hanging up around the city at the time, uh, you know, actors and actresses who were in films that I had never heard of before, um, politicians who, you know, maybe at the time everybody knew, but they've since become really obscure, uh, musicians, there are, um, uh, what I discovered, I do, when I work, um, when I come across a strange phrase, I tend to throw it into Google these days, uh, often into Google Books, and I found out that he was um, quoting a lot of translations, for instance, of uh, French poetry into Czech from the 19th century, um, which I, I know he must have been reading at the time, maybe it were gender, I can shed some more light on that. Um, so this is just to kind of give you a, uh, an example of some of the um, things, you know, that go into a translation, the kind of research that has to be done. And, um, and then beyond that, his, his um, I guess I would say the structure of his sentences is sometimes really um, complex in a way that I had to sit with um, a Czech friend and parse out literally word by word what is he actually saying here. Um, and sometimes, um, I felt like I just had to make a leap and say, you know, with a friend, this is, and I had, you know, a couple other people reading the book. Um, uh, you know, I sometimes feel like translators actually should be called interpreters, and interpreters should be called translators because, you know, we're doing, I think, a lot more interpreting as translators of written text than interpreters are doing when they're translating, uh, you know, live. Um, so there was a lot of interpreting that went into this um, translation as well. Um, I mean, we can come back to all this, of course, but um, um, so the, the other thing I think that was uh, important to me at first was, you know, the title, Midway Upon the Journey of Our Life, is from the first line of Dante's Inferno, and uh, actually, um, at one point when I was in the early draft of the book, uh, I, I did a residency and spent three weeks um, with other translators and I was working on the translation at the time and I actually had a kind of a panic attack because this uh, Argentinian poet who was there said, what if the whole book is actually a coded version of Dante's <laughs> I, I said, oh no, so I had to stop and go read that. <laughs> the good news is it's not. <laughs> so, uh, but there are some quotes from that in there as well. And you know, this thing about, I'm sure other translators, I know there are a lot of translators in the house, and I can identify with this sometimes, you know, you, when you've got a, an author who's quoting uh, uh, from other texts and translated into their language, um, you know, you have to make a decision. Are you going to go with an authoritative translation of that in your own language? Are you going to translate yourself? Or are you going to do a mix? And um, 
the version of the of uh, um, uh, Inferno that I read was by this. Uh, I picked one from the mid fifties actually. Is by uh, an American poet named Paul Chiardi, who was uh, I guess he was the editor of the Saturday Review, and um, uh, apparently he directed the Breadloaf Writers Conference in the early days too. It turns out. Um, but so I used uh, variations mostly on his um, translations when I, when I came across it in the text. But again, often I have to do that to find out. And, uh, so I mean, you're kind of at the beginning of our talk here getting into really micro details. We'll talk about the themes too. But as a translator, uh, until it gets to near the end, I'm usually thinking much more about these micro level things than I am about the overall. Uh, themes, um, uh, but I did have help too from uh, Rajendra, who fortunately had written uh, a paper uh, about Yedlichka and Durek? and Durek together. Yeah, that's what I thought. But because they both lived in um, northwestern Bohemia, uh, we can come back to that. I don't want to. I, I used to sit here and talk for an hour. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of levels to it. Uh. Okay, well, let's take it to Owen. Um, can you tell us um, something about the environment in which Yenishka was writing and you can be made to be socialist architecture and design in 1950s and what kind of um, human being perhaps uh, shaped them? Sure. I mean, in order to do this, I have to go and um, start. Well, we start almost a bit, quite a lot earlier than the book. I, I, I wasn't aware of this book until until Chandra suggested that I that that, that, that I was it in some way. And, and, but I was aware of the of the building where most of it takes place, um, which is um, called it a sort of very socialist acronym, the Kaldum, or the Collective House, which is the kind of expanding <coughs> of the um, which is a building that actually. Even for its time, was enormously hated, um, and really to kind of work out where that building comes from, you have to go to actually around the time when 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 Gedlicka was born. He refers to at one point being born in the year of Lindbergh's flight and, and left a bit of it his last protest, which refers obviously to Lindbergh's flight and also to the last couple of demonstrations in the Soviet Union, pretty much till the 80s in 1927. Um, when left with the try you make Leon Trotsky and was very small and very quickly surprised the protest in that square. So um, at that point Czech architects and Czech intellectuals, I think particularly the circle around Carol Tiger and the Red and the Red Group, were enormously enthusiastic about um, the particular architectures that were being developed at that point in the Soviet Union, particularly the collective houses that were being built quite small numbers in Moscow and also a few industrial cities. Um, the kind of paradigmatic one of these being the Narkom in, 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 in Moscow, which still stands as a small part, um, which combined very, very small flats, many of them without kitchens, that would be connected with a park, a roof garden, a public canteen, um, a library, and gymnasium. And the, this was instilled, as far as the architects were concerned, a sort of socialist consciousness. And already by, you know, by uh, within about five years, this was not an architectural factor in the Soviet Union, both in terms of the social ideas of that building and the architectural ones, they were completely verboten by about 1934. So the living of collective house is almost exactly uh, sort of out for magazines in 1927. It's exactly the sort of thing that people like Carol Tiger in the 20s were dreaming of, what they thought that one day they would get to build a check for the bank in. Um, and there's a, there's a passage where it's, where, where it, it's first described, and I want to read out. Um, Nevertheless, ignoring the warning signs of those who died in agony, buried under the distillation columns and the ancient wisdom that there are places where the grass won't grow a grow hundred years, they decided to build a modern socialist urban centre here, a city of the future. One group of architects drew up a set of tidy plans for scenes of children playing, which served as the basis for construction of the community of model homes, while another designed a collective house of 1,500 people, 
for the cinema, a cafe, a nursery school, daycare centres, shops, a hairdresser, electrical, and an electric refrigerator. The Daily Ladder Frontera and photographs of the fans reproduced so poorly that it shifted them into the realms of fiction. Alongside Pern, Pavadamir, Mayakovsky, and Gigi Orton, all this in the days when we were marching in May Day Parade, singing the song of the refrain, the teacher was living. Some of us went up to build this beautiful truck. It goes on. Right. I believe that here in this house, in this very room with my bookshelf, bed, and desk now stand, where the door opens to a third all by itself, a young man and a young woman, one warm night, sat on a mortar truck. I believe that they kissed here out the stars and spoke to each other in whispers about the future inhabitants of the they were building. I believe that because in those days nothing was lost yet, and also because it's an ancient theme. The endlessly reworked motif of the head of the family who plants a tree for his grandchildren, because it's a great and fundamental theme for the future, human solidarity, and hope. And that was how it really was in those first years after the war, when we ended even our love letters to the slogan of this work. We dreamed of our own destiny as self-destructive, messianic dream of work tomorrow. Um, that's... I, I think captures as well as as well as this quite particular style of some ships and this sort of almost sort of parodic montage approach very very quickly from you know a sort of information to anecdote to, to something quite hallucinatory. Um, but but also what makes this a really, really, really specific building and, and, and why this is was being critiqued. Now probably that's happened to us because this happened to be when the author I believe had that had been sent um, after being after he left the Communist Party. So um, but the projects of Czech Stalinists are mostly a kind of are basically direct copies of what was happening at that point in the Soviet Union. So something like the Peruba housing estate in Ostrava is a really classic example of this. The sort of grand archway with heroic sculpture on top model, very directly on the general staff building in St. Petersburg. A very, very pompous neoclassicism with single family houses inside, quite conservative. Um, the collective house wasn't conserved, and it's something that has been imaginable only in the first few years after the war, in which you could have a kind of modern architecture in Czechoslovakia and at the same time be a committed Stalinist, something that after 1948, I think for about 10 years, wasn't really possible to buy and roll. Um, and a huge amount of modernist architects had to go off and do these much more traditional houses. So things like the collective house promised a particular new kind of everyday life particular new kind of, um, I, I guess a new human being would be, would be created by it. And a lot of what this novel does is, is very, very bitterly suggest what, what, what actually happened. Um, but it's, it's interesting that, 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 again, just how specific this is, it's a specific place at a specific time. You wouldn't have been able to write this novel in Poland, largely because, first of all, no, you know, there were no projects like the collective house there, because you need you needed a sort of enthusiastic, you know, sort of uh, young communist as opposed to convincing. When Yedluska talks about this, we talk about we, the Polish writers, at the same time we talk about them. And I think that there's a, the, 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 what kind of ambushes it in a, in a way is that it's something much more, um, much, much more subtle, you know, that the, 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 the thing that's criticized almost as, as in many ways, modernity itself, that the, the, consume, the accumulation of consumer goods, um, the kind of nuclear family, that the people that are trying to live a new everyday life are constantly brought back into something else. One of the most kind of horrible um, anecdotes in the book is of a young worker who, who um, decides to educate himself in romantic poetry. Yes, and so every night he's kind of reading these like Czech classics, romantic poetry, uh, to his wife's baffled. And eventually he, he, he beats her. He sort of beats her up while shouting these bits of romantic poetry. He's so, studying to get a promotion at work. Yeah. So this is the thing. There is this kind of... Um, <laughs> and while you would be studying romantic poetry to get a promotion at work, so it captures lots of uncertainty. <laughs> so there's one... A bit of a bit of a Exactly. So um, there's, a, there's just two paragraphs I was finished with from the... Um, from his sort of description of the very, very swift decline of the collective house. The gypsies found out they were eligible for a ration of low priced coke from the factory, stopped tearing up the floorboards for heat, and formed a folk music group to showcase the rich tradition of popular culture. They had a simple on ship to Slovakia and began playing in the collective house's newly opened cafe. 
Saturdays and Sundays they were performing till past midnight, and on payday the foreman and technicians from the Stalin Brothers would part of ten crown notes, the musicians sweaty foreheads in accordance with the old custom. And one day at long last, the collecting house filled with people. Balconies were draped from laundry to dry, the children around the hallways playing spy and kicking balls, and the odour of exhaust from the ventilated kitchens hung over the landings, blending together into an aroma of well-being. Some amenities, however, turn out to be unusable, and the new era of bringing new needs to come from the sea required further modification. Rather than stop using the shared fridge when they realised food was being stolen, lockers for grocery deliveries ended up storing old shoes, and the projected library turned out to be a police station instead. The lecture hall plays host to a magic show every now and then, and doctors fielding questions from a few old women worried about cancer. Most of the elderly, though, are dying off. Their hearts can't take the climb to the 9th or 11th floor when the elevators are recorded. Thank you, Alan. Um, can we take back to go back to the Alan yeah, yeah, I, um, I realized being asked what, what it was like to translate the book, I probably needed to talk a little bit more about the context, but it really, you know, really is a book of disillusionment, and uh, in the literal sense of the word. And uh, Yedlichka was somebody who had joined the Communist Party, but um, the Communists came to power, seized power in a non-violent coup, back to the threat of violence in February 1948, and he left the party already in, I think it was August, uh, so very quickly. And so, couldn't continue to study at Charles University. His wife was a physician. She got a job in Litvino, which was a, is a town on the border, uh, and it's important to know that this was a town that had been part of the so-called Sudetenland. Uh, so the Germans had been, um, uh, ejected from the country and effectively uh, when the communists came to power they colonized or recolonized these lands by sending checks and people from all over the country to resettle the land but at the same time this this particular area was very heavily industrialized uh, uh, the nazi germans had run uh, basically a slave labor camp there with um, uh, uh, deportees from uh, all over western europe belgians and french apparently particularly. Um, so he talks about um, almost overnight uh, these uh, concentration camp barracks being turned into uh, uh, dormitories for socialist youth brigades. Um, and, but meanwhile, the destruction of the environment went on apace. And the, one of the things that made the biggest impression on me was his descriptions of the destruction of the environment. And again, this is the you know, late 40s, early 50s, and, and um, I don't really, I, I mean, I can't think of any other book from the 50s, not that I'm a scholar that I know every book from the 50s, that's describing the destruction of the environment in a way that I think, to me, felt really contemporary. And, uh, you know, this idea of a development as a, as a destructive force, it's just so brutally clear in this book. Um, that makes a, a really big impression on me. Um, and, um, and then as far as you know, his technique goes, he talks about, and this is where the Shklovsky comes in, that he's writing the book um, as if he were a, a policeman. Uh, and he says his method is that of a, a policeman and I'm giving a testimony. And um, you know, he talks about um, political questionnaires that people had to fill out uh, to get jobs as being a kind of form of literature. And so you know, he's really subjecting uh, all of his life to this um, uh, kind of literary scrutiny and, and talking a lot about how uh, uh, his, um, how he writes about his experience is um, uh, uh, a kind of a literary experiment in and of itself. And um, yeah, I guess I think that's all I want. Just to give a little bit more of the background, of the political background of what was happening at that time. And um, this, uh, we'll uh, read a quote uh, section later on. The, you know, one of the, besides the destruction of the environment, I think another reason that it wasn't possible for him to publish a book like this at the time was uh, it really lays bare the consumerist desires that were um, underneath and the communists kind of tried to, you know, suppress. Um, you know, this is at a time when, you know, but I'm basically, on both sides of the Iron Curtain, there was actually a huge emphasis on, uh, uh, you know, growth in consumer and consumption. Um, there was something that was shared, whether 
who are communists or capitalists, that regimes brag about their ability to supply uh, uh, consumer goods to their populations, which I think is really interesting. And again, I don't see talked about that much, at least in today's so. Thank you. Now, can we ask Rajendra perhaps? Um, uh, so, or do you want to? Uh, we have a script here, by the way. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, so this is, uh, or are you going to talk about it afterwards? So, so this is a scene uh, um, from February 1948. Uh, as the uh, Communist Party uh, took power, um, again, by threatening, um, they were in the government. Communists had actually won a plurality of the vote, correct, but not a majority, in the first elections after World War II. And um, they basically, by threatening a mobilization in the streets and workers going on strike, to, they were kind of threatening and having the other states being taken over. Uh, more forcefully in the East Bloc, they, uh, other non-communist non ministers in the government all resigned, which left the path open for uh, the communists to come to power, and the leader of the Communist Party was Clement Guthwell, and he gave this speech, um, well, he gave this famous speech on Old Town Square uh, that Kundera writes about in the Book of Left and Forgetting. This is a scene describing um, uh, one of the anniversaries of the revolution. I think this is, so there are different versions of this book actually that were published and I don't want to get too far into that, but I think I figured out that this was actually six years later in one of the versions of the book it makes it clear, so it's the sixth anniversary of the February 1948 revolution. Day broke and the loudspeakers lining the streets began broadcasting a program to mark the anniversary of the February revolution. It gave you the feeling that on any corner you might stumble upon a thousand-headed throng, past mingling with present in a disturbing illusion de déjà vu. It was raining like it had been then, back in 48, but the street was deserted except for some trash men banging trash cans around. It was Gottwald speaking, a recording of his speech on Old Town Square. His voice kept fading out, lost in the rising cries of the enormous crowd. I listened closely in the hope that I might recognize the past of my own voice, but my listening was in vain. Public expressions of jubilation had yet to be refined, and our cries were for the most part inarticulate. We stood there in front of Kinsky Palace bareheaded, hands in our pockets, as a somber crowd flooded the square from the surrounding streets. Metal workers and machinists from the Chekade and Ringhofer factories, munitions <coughs> workers from the Zhishkov cartridge company, bashful men with briefcases, and 40-something-year-old men with the air of frightened chickens and the future of district school inspector written on their foreheads. <laughs> a few girls in national costume, according to the custom established in 45, clambered up onto the rain-soaked monument to Jan Hus. The lights blazed in the tall windows of the insurance company, where men and women sat hunched over their typewriters and calculators, tirelessly pecking away. The manager of the tavern next door to the Stork House had a table set up in the passageway in front of the tap room, offering tea and frankfurters for sale. Gottwald appeared amid a small coterie on the balcony of the palace, directly above the grilled windows from which Franz Kafka once contemplated the Marion column. The shouts and cheers that now carried through the deserted street with the banging trash cans were accompanied by the waving of banners and standards. A wet snow fell as Gottwald began his speech. Suddenly we realized the moment was historic. The speaker's appearance was accentuated with a Persian lamb hat and an obvious attempt to set the moment apart from the everyday order of things. The era of flat caps was drawing to a close and the age of brimmed hats was dawning. The lamb hat guaranteed a smooth transition. He had never worn one before and would never wear one again. He spoke in a deep, faltering voice, restarting some sentences three or four times, while we stood there, below the balcony, chanting slogans, squeezed between men in blue coveralls, trying in vain to adjust our indoor voices to match the screams of the women in red scarves, who would later play such an important role in the ethnography of the May Day Parade's joyous optimism. 
Wispy flakes of snow melted on our glowing cheeks as we lifted our faces to see. A flock of doves frantically circled the table. Today I can no longer find the pathos in that moment. Perhaps there was none. All that remains of it for me now is an unsettling bird smell, a reminder of the feeling that comes over me whenever I'm squeezed into the middle of a crowd, a subconscious fear of being trampled to death in a panic. The psychiatric term for it, I believe, is claustrophobia. I'm afraid of bur being buried alive, a friend of mine often says. I'm going to have an electric buzzer installed in my grave. <laughs> it's birth trauma, says my wife. Everyone has it. A poet friend chimes in with a motif of the pastoral novel. Once, near where we live, they exhumed a grave and found the deceased lying in the coffin with his face to the bottom and all his fingers chewed to the bone. Not to mention that countess from Brno with her head gracefully tilted, just so. Schopenhauer, says another, put in his will that he couldn't be buried until his body showed clear signs of decomposition. Schopenhauer, of course, being the last word in European philosophy, adds yet another, whose wife is in her eighth month. From there we move to deeds, by which, of course, I mean Auschwitz, Maidanek, and Katyn. As for me, I say nothing, anxiously dismissing the thought of the most terrifying story I know, Kafka's diary entry about two children, alone in their home, who climbed into a large trunk, shut the lid behind them, and suffocated to death. So Gottwald has delivered his speech, and now, in the thickening rain of myth, the final battle cries are sounded through the jubilant hordes, many of whom have surely been visited since that day of death, since that day by death on its silent advance toward this rainy day of a higher order reality. The banners hang limply on the rain-soaked flagpoles, and in the barracks overlooking the smoking chasm of the open pit mine, a snow-white feather of down still circles above the stove. A brisk march rings out from the street-side loudspeakers. It's a new spring for socialism. There were a few other speakers after Gothwald that day. We had a chance to hear Jan Durda in a rainproof jacket and a member of parliament from the Social Democrats wearing a beret. That one sure doesn't look like she just switched sides yesterday, remarked a man in the crowd in front of Kinsky Palace. Everywhere, comrades, I'm telling you, we had our people everywhere. This was long before the female trainees at the mining school in Schönbach near Litvinov started wearing their hair cropped short. That is, long before they saw Lucia Bose, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, on the silver screen, there were still posters for the Social Democrats plastered around Prague with a picture of the Tower of London and the slogan, Our Banner Waves Over Thrones. And by a strange oversight, a photo of Clara Zetkin in a tie and striped blouse still adorned the walls of some workers' clubhouses. We returned home that February day, soaking wet and excited. As usual, Kay, the medical student, who later went on to become a prominent party functionary in one of the border regions, was sitting at the gramophone playing El Malai Rachami. Joska the miner from Komojani was brewing him a cup of tea and had a plate of warm garlic bread waiting for us. As Petr Zenkel drove off to his friends for a pig roast, an arrogant smile plastered on his foolish face, my friend, now long lost in the caustic ash of years, paged through an album of family photographs with his first love, the child who left the prints of his little bare feet in the concrete in the middle of the old section of Litvinov was delirious with fever. Gottwald cruised the streets of Prague in an armored limousine, and a wild rabbit shivered with cold in the corner of my unfinished room. The era of capitalism had come to an end, and a new social order, a socialist order, was installed in its place. Thank you, Andre. So, Rajendra, can we um, go and talk more about how this kind of sort of eyewitness account people might be familiar with here, perhaps from Kundera's uh, Already, but how does Sievich Kasanov fit into Czech literature at the time that people might know? Okay, yeah, um, I, I think this is, uh, uh, I, I, there is a way into this text, I think, for people, because um, in fact, probably the best known uh, Czech literature is our writers like Alan Kundera, but also people may have read Ivan Klima, Josef Skoretsky, these were the writers that were published and who were. <coughs> In a sense, contemporaries of Yedlichka, they were contemporaries of Yedlichka, they were contemporaries also in terms of publication. This book comes out in 1966. 
uh, Milan Kundera's novel, for example, The Joke, comes out in 1967. It's refused, I think, in 1965. Um, Skoretsky, by this time, has published several texts that are also memories of the 1940s. Um, but there's a very important difference between uh, Yedlitschka and all of these writers uh, in that uh, all of them are children, very much as I think Owen and Alex have been saying, they are children of this um, period, uh, this interwar period, where there has been um, a great fascination with French literature, with French uh, poetry, which has been mentioned, which inspires the young avant-garde, uh, Marxist avant-garde writers of the 1920s and 1930s that these guys grow up with, they, so that as, as teenagers, as young men in the sensitive years of their life, they are reading these poets in the 1920s who've been inspired by the, the sort of French modernist uh, writers and also inspired by formalism and, and surrounded by ideas, basically. Um, and the response in the 1960s, the 1960s is a period generally of reckoning in Czech literature when uh, people look back at what has happened. They are given a space, a moment, if you like, um, when they can kind of reflect on what has happened since the liberation in 1945, since the communist takeover of 1948, and a lot of literature in the 1960s is this kind of reflecting on me in my 40s as a young man, you know, what did I do, what was my experience of this? Um, but all of these writers, like Kundera, uh, Klima, Skoretsky, um, the, the dominant tone is one of a mixture of self-pity, self-justification, uh, uh, a kind of whitewashing of the generation. We didn't know, we didn't properly understand. I wasn't there at that point, there's a alibism. Yeah, these are the, the kind of framework which they deal with, which those of you, for example, are familiar with the joke, uh, will know is one not of confession and of repentance, but of, of, of self-justification. And Yedlitschka's text, which very importantly comes from uh, an earlier period, is not like that. And yet, I, I think that Yedlitschka had less to blame himself for than some of these other writers in the sense that he leaves the book, as far as I know, in March 1948. He spends the summer uh, talking to uh, a guy uh, who had been a member of the Communist Party uh, in the 1920s and 1930s and had left the party in the 1930s already when he knew what was going on in the Soviet Union and felt he didn't want to be part of that. So Yedlitschka, in a sense, is influenced by an older generation of people who have already left the party really before the Stalinization. Um, and yet his text, as much more as, as uh, Owen Ray, you know, rightly notes, he, he includes himself in the people who've created this society. It's my fault, yeah, I'm, I'm part of this. And this whole text is a kind of, um, he's punishing himself. He, he's, he almost presents this idea, I've got to this place so I can sit and watch it in all its dysfunction, in all its awfulness. And so, I, so there's this kind of sense of kind of uh, self you know, chastisement in the writing. And uh, that is an extremely different experience, I think, for us than to read uh, the way that Klima and Kondera and Skoretsky and others um, deal with the same uh, experience. Um, and I think it is really excellent, actually, to compare the passage in Book of Laughter and Forgetting when Kundara remembers standing on the square hearing this, and he talks, this is the passage about the ring dance, joining the ring dance of, of communism, and then one day finding himself excluded from the ring dance, and so on. And comparing that passage with the way that Yedlitschka describes the same uh, moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is a really important addition in reflecting specifically on the Czechoslovak experience, perhaps more gen generally on the European post-war experience, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. how people are, in, are involved, um, and, and, and the way that they interpret their involvement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, here, last question. Is that what's next? Somebody want to go grab the Kundera book so we can read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the book is, um, it does have some really brutal um, passages. And, um, you know, one of the things that I say in, uh, in my afterword is one of the things that struck me about it was the violence uh, in this book that I really had, in a way, I really had encountered in any other Czech novel I'd read. Violence uh, specifically committed by men against women against children and against the environment. I mean, if you, I didn't necessarily see it that way the first couple times I read the book, but by the time I got to the end, I just, you know, that was really clear to me. Um, and I, you know, I 
think that one way to read the book, it's not the way that Yedlichka would have read it. I'm sure this word wasn't in his vocabulary, especially since he barely knew where claustrophobia was. <laughs> the kind of a condemnation of, of patriarchy, because this is a really, this is a world ruled by men, and you see it over and over in the book. Um, it's there's a lot of beating and uh, destruction, um, and it's it's always by men. Like, going outward um, uh, against their surroundings, whoever happens to be. And, and But what is, um, I don't want to say redeems him, but he, as Regenera said, Yedlichka does not exclude himself from this. I mean, he describes hitting his son, you know, and, and the feelings that he goes through when he does it. And when I say feelings, I'm not talking about like an American soap opera or something like that. Like, how did it feel to, you know? Um, it's, he's not, um, I don't think he's pardoning himself, you know. Um, um, and you know, this midway upon the journey of our life, of course, refers partly to where he is in his life in terms of his age. But he also, you know, as Regenera says in the article he wrote, this is this is his hell, and he's he's going through hell here. And I would be interested to know what his wife thought. But, <laughs> um, I don't know. She didn't so. Um, Yeah, here we go with some consumer envy and domestic violence. <laughs> uh, not socialist realism. I had to look up the, the name of the washing machine, and it turns out um, there's actually a museum of old washing machines to check plans. And this picture was on their website. Yeah. That old, yeah. Amazing. I sometimes think it would be great to do, you know, the edition of the book with all the you know notes, like with the hyperlinks to all the things that you look up. Um, I just want to see if there's anything else I should tell you about this section. So yeah, this is a scene that's taking place in the collective house. And again, you know, this is against the backdrop of this collective house, which is supposed to be this model home, right, of collective living. And the contrast between what the ideals is supposed to represent and the reality is, is really The workers' barracks stand arrayed around the factory and perched along the edges of the gaping open pit mines. The buildings are left over from the German concentration camps. Around 1950, some were returned to their original purpose, while others were modified for use as family housing or lodging for volunteer work brigades. Two sets of two rooms with a small shared entryway, then they carried out a general disinfection and set up a dispensary for treatment of venereal disease. Many brigade workers had ended up getting married here, and social relations were increasingly shaped by family life. This year, on the occasion of the February anniversary, the miners received a bonus. The red banners drooped in the sleep the way they had back in 48, and Joska the miners switchblade. Joska, who I heard ended up marrying the daughter of a Slovak wine distiller, had been gathering rust under the eaves for years now. František Pomikal used the money from his bonus to buy his family an electric washing machine. There was a line in front of the shop, but they got what they had come for. They used a child's wagon to cart it home through the sleep, man in front, women and children pushing from behind. <clears throat> the children were so excited they crashed the wagon into the wall, giving the washer a scrape. No big deal, Pomikal said. Kids, what can you do? I'll touch it up tomorrow. It'll be just like new. The motor's what counts. You don't buy a washer for show. And the motor runs like a dream, I can tell you that much. His neighbor, Josef Svitak, helped him get it into the building, while the Pomakal children stuck out their tongues at the kids ne next door, chanting, na 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 we've got a new pad of top. <laughs> <laughs> the next door neighbor cuffed her children on the head as they looked on mutely, passive and helpless. They couldn't resist chiming in herself, looks kind of scraped. <laughs> Sometimes you really do get lucky in life, said Pomikal's wife as they installed the machine in the corner next to the stove. There were a good 60 of us and just 11 washers. They still had to extend the cord and adjust the contact. The fuses blew a few times, but finally the machine started up. They stood watching in silent amazement. Pomikal squatted on his haunches, switching the washer on and off. 
Smithock listened, facing the window. I'd say it knocks, he remarked. Well, you'd be wrong, said John McCall. It runs like clockwork. <laughs> Still, he took a step back and lowered his head with a look of concentration on his face. Outside, the red banners flapped against the flagpoles. I can tell when a washer knocks, he said after a moment. Whatever you say, Smithock said, walking out without a goodbye. That night, the Pomacall family practically didn't practically didn't eat, switching the washer on and off until nearly midnight. <laughs> the father got up every now and then to stretch his legs. The two youngest children fell asleep on the floor. Morning came and Pomacall left for work. Smithock had the afternoon shift, but he hadn't been able to sleep well during the night, so he got dressed while it was still dark and sat with his elbows propped on the table, a cigarette between his fingers. His wife, barely awake, said from under the covers, you suck those things down all day long, one after the other. Svidak ignored her, staring gloomily into the empty corner next to the range. After a while, his wife, moaning and groaning, got out of bed, turned on the radio, and, still in her nightshirt, went to the faucet to fill the wash pot. It's me, me, young liberty, a red-petaled flower, blossoming free, Rudolf Cortez sang. Look at Pomikal, Svidakova shouted over the water tanging against the metal. Look at him. You don't see him smoking. <laughs> Pomekal, Svitak muttered. Yeah, well, Pomekal can kiss my... Because it's true, his wife said illogically, setting the pot on the stove. Her breasts, large and swollen underneath her soaked nightshirt, flopped against her drooping belly. Her husband slowly stamped out his cigarette and turned away toward the window where, outside, clumps of damp snow floated in the first morning light. There's a new operator on the hoist at the fourth incline, he said with spite in his voice. Damn good woman, hard as coal. Everyone, you hear me? Everyone's got a perota nowadays. His wife collapsed, crying onto a chair. Cold, she sobbed. Everyone's got one, even the gypsies. Stop your blubbering, Svidak said. He buttoned up his shirt sleeves, crossed through the shared entryway, and stepped into the neighbor's space without knocking. Pomikal's wife was heating a bottle of milk for the baby. Ennobled by her new possession, she chided the children clustered around the washing machine. Don't you know how to say hello? Svitak slammed the door. I thought so, he said. That would suit you, wouldn't it? Stuffing your belly off the sweat of the working class. He shoved the woman out of the way, and in two long strides, he was at the machine. Are you crazy? Pomikalova shouted. But Svitak had already yanked the plug out of the wall and kicked over the washer. As the children, screaming, threw themselves at his legs, their mother jumped in and ripped open the shirt on his back. If I say it knocks, Svitak roared, stomping up and down on the machine, then by God almighty it knocks. Homikalova bit and scratched, but Svitak hit her in the head, and brandishing the poker he rasped, I'm going to smash this whole place to smithereens. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is going to tell me whether or not a motor knocks. His wife, drawn by the commotion, entered in a flowery robe to find the Pomikal family rolling on the ground in a pool of blood, while Svitak pounded the washer into a shapeless clump. The other neighbors came running as well. Yep, said a woman cradling an infant in her arms. Like I always say, no tree grows to heaven. I've got nothing against giving a broad a slap or two from time to time, but a machine, now that's something else, commented an older man turning his back on the scene. Svitakova stepped toward the wall with a determined look in her eye and tore down a photograph of her and Pomikalova standing side by side in a group of young girls, a souvenir from the days when they were still single, and practiced gymnastics routines together at the Red Trade Union's Academy. In the process, she overturned the pot on the stove. Look, oxtail, cried the woman from the building across the way. Can you believe it? I wonder where they dug that up. I haven't seen any oxtail for a good year and a half. How much are you willing to pay, ma'am? A pimpled adolescent grinned, and everyone burst out laughing, while Svitakova tore off the tablecloth and trampled on the comforters, sending feathers slowly circling through the air. Finally, two men tore Svitak away from the machine. The parts aren't worth a tinker's damn, said one of them, pocketing the rotor on the slide. <laughs> Meanwhile, another neighbor called the medical center, since there were wounded and since calling a doctor is standard practice when people don't know what else to do. 
There were still feathers floating in the air when the ambulance arrived with a young female practitioner who dressed the wounds and drew up the medical certificates attesting to bodily harm. <laughs> I was going to say one thing which is probably quite important is that this, this text at the time is absolutely at odds with the propaganda, the very uh, available propaganda that the party is saying about this region, about what is happening here. This is, as, as I was saying, this is where socialism is being built first and best. This is where the communities are coming together. Everything is working beautifully. There were exhibitions about this. There were there were lots of pamphlets and publications and posters and so on and so on. So very much this description is, is, is you know, at the time is, is you know it, 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 the, the reason he's showing all the detail, putting everything in as a kind of testimony, as you say. This is what it was really like. Well, there's some of the details, you know, this thing about you know these little mentions of the red banners drooping outside, and you know he's always throwing in these contrasts, and it, and it makes it really vivid, even if. If you're not familiar with the historical context, you can see these, these you know, really, um, I don't know if they're really ironic contrasts, kind of, uh, really uh, depressing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> On that happy note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I open um, questions to the public? So, do you have any questions to the panelists? I just wanted to ask you about some more detail about the relationship you're talking about between Yelich uh, and Tukhilo back in Noam Czech and anti-communist countries in the Sixth. Firstly, were they actually familiar with this work? Did they comment on it? And you were saying always there's this important contrast. Um, do you think they consciously reject it? Or is it simply you have different parties developing in a different way? Yeah, I, you're the literary scholar. <laughs> well, I think it's very important, and it, it's somewhat misleading. When the when the book comes out again in 1994, there's a lot of discussion about how this was a forgotten and censored book. But actually, uh, when it came out in 1966, it was very well received. There were a lot of reviews of it in the mainstream press, and uh, it very much chimed with the kind of revelations, particularly about the environment of North Bohemia. And what's, it, 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 this was a period when you know uh, there was a kind of discussion going on. About about what had happened there. Um, and uh, this book seemed to fit that, and it also fitted this mood of kind of, of disillusion among intellectuals and reflections. So uh, I would say, actually, it probably fitted in more than it stood at odds to, to that discussion. And it was really later on that you actually, you can look at it and see that actually the way that he's responded to this experience is completely different to the way, yeah, so it kind of fits in, I think, in, in that period. Um, and uh, as uh, I think various people have already said, you know, it, it, it's it's quite strange in a way that it's such a thin book, it's such a you know, it's such a tight account of it. It's, it you know, it would have been extraordinary if it had come out, you know, in, in English or in French in that in that period, you know, alongside the, the writers that I mentioned. So I don't think um, that they rejected. I feel, I and mean, I, I don't know if that's putting it too strongly, but. You know, you can see an awful lot of the imagery, particularly from Kundera, the, the, the first passage you read, Alex, of, about, um, it, a lot of you know Kundera, you know, his, his, his kind of reaction to lyric, lyric poetry as being, he sort of identifies it with propaganda, with the denial of reality, you know, in the sort of imaginary worlds of lyric writing, and he compares this to when he was a lyric poet and he becomes a prose writer. And, but we have this in Yedichka, long before Durek, uh, long before, sorry, uh, long before Kundera makes that, makes that transition himself. So, so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's uh, it, it's a bit of, as I say, I think it's a bit of an encyclopedia of the themes that you find in Schwarzenegger, you know, nylon, and jazz is in there. You yeah. know, it's lots and lots of things that are, that are you know, make sure it see the, the cowards, which uh, was about the fifties, but wasn't published until what was the sixties? Well, about forty-five, isn't it? It's about nineteen forty-five. Yeah, fifty-eight. It published in oh, so, yeah, Okay, yeah. but that wasn't, and that wasn't translated until the seventies. So actually, yeah. So it's actually it's covering the same period, uh, written later. It's incredibly dense novel, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you read it, it's very short, but so many 